I'm Edward McCrary from the Philippine Islands. I was 14 when imprisoned by the Japanese, 17 when released. Initially I was in the Iloilo camp of 100 people, then moved to Santo Tomas with 3,700. Uh, your questions and your search at this time is about the younger people in the camp, who today are the survivors of the camp. And uh, I should caution that uh, young people all over the world, whether it's New York City, Timbuktu, uh, Congo, the reality they're in is the reality that is, is what shapes them and makes them. So they're not fighting a reality, they're in it. So the teenagers in camp were living the time and the moment. And for many, for much of the time, it was one long summer camp with some school. The teachers were there. But we had sports, we had games, we had cliques. Uh, it was very much a small town village life, except we all had side jobs of some kind. And always somewhere in the back of 90% of us and in the front of the mind of some of the more neurotic few uh, was we were prisoners uh, and there was danger. But again, that's why 18-year-olds make good soldiers. Uh, the danger was going to be for somebody else. We were all immortal. So we went through camp, most of us I would say, in a different way than others. It was shocking to people who read about prison camps, a very normal existence. But I've talked to people from Auschwitz who were of the same age, and in the strange warped way, it was absolutely the same. Uh, your life is your life, and your friends are your friends, and the situation is the situation. You don't dwell on it with the conscious mind, or maybe it's the conscious mind that dwells, and the unconscious holds back the fear, which was there. Uh, things did change. Uh, it seemed, and I know it was actually the case, and there are reasons for it, every time there was a major naval defeat for the Japanese, our rations got cut. This is because their ships were not bringing supplies, but also uh, they were peaked. And our camp had been taken over at one point by the Kemp Tai, the secret police, who were deadly people. And uh, the gate slammed, and uh, we quickly went into about an eight-month decline. And uh, I myself worked in the uh, kitchens and the food lines, uh, was young and relatively healthy, but at the last month when we came in with these, 20-gallon uh, pots of lugao soup to swing them up onto the counter for uh, being served. Uh, I was getting dizzy and I had to stop. Uh, my father, who weighed 155 pounds going in, uh, weighed 84. And as we say in one of the exhibits here, uh, uh, a young man looking at his father wondered, every morning I would wonder if I'd look at him, he was pale blue-gray. Is he still alive? But he lived in 94. Uh, uh, did you know of specific people who were tortured or killed? Of, I have to yeah. this. These questions were made up by a teenager. Yeah, of course. So this is what she yeah. wanted to know. Yeah. Uh, you have to remember, ours was a civilian prison camp. So compared to the soldiers, we were in some kind of a resort or so relative. Yes, uh, uh, the three uh, committee members that were our representatives to the Japanese uh, towards the end were taken out and mutilated and uh, the bodies identified. They were taken to the notorious Fort Santiago. Uh, Early in the game, uh, when we had a lot of merchant marine men and such in camp, uh, and uh, a couple of guys broke out of camp and uh, got drunk and were wandering around uh, in, we'll call them houses of ill repute. Uh, and they were caught so fast, and they were whipped, and uh, some of them killed. Uh, so there was this occasional thing. But uh, if you bowed to the captain of the guard, the guards when you encountered them and uh, kept out of their way. Uh, they did not go out looking for you. And again, we were very lucky. Uh, as you've heard, uh, the military prisoners uh, had very harsh treatment. And uh, sometimes if one escaped, ten were killed, that sort of thing was uh, commonplace. 
but uh, we uh, had a relatively easy time of it until they just forgot to feed us and uh, the death rate then began to climb and it, the pictures can look like Dachau but uh, it wasn't Dachau yet. Another two months and we would have been goners, uh, most of us. But as it is, uh, the cavalry came just in time. Uh, were you ever aware of what was going on in the outside world? Yes. Uh, we were given... Yeah. Sorry, Forgive me, yes. Uh, the outside world was not vanished to us. Uh, it was available in two ways. One was Japanese newspapers, and the other was we had at least two, I know of two, of uh, secret radios in camp. And the neatest one of all, we had a little stage area where we had uh, uh, skits and shows we would give each other and in the loudspeaker system for this and the engineers uh, I think it was Bell of GE the head of the GE was a good engineer and uh, we told the Japanese that we were putting in this sound system and they had to check that sound system a lot because they had all these troubles with it and that sound system was really a radio that was also a voice out you know, and the fellow would be up there checking the sound system and what he was actually doing was getting the news from uh, San Francisco on long wave and the Jap guard would patrol and he had no technology and didn't know and hardly cared so that was one of our main radio sources and uh, uh, the same that, I'll tell you something about the uh, entertainment area because we had loudspeakers every night they'd play certain songs it was time to close down and uh, get back to your rooms and uh, the first air raid was an incredible thing. 300 airplanes came and took over the harbor. And uh, all American. And the next morning, the loudspeaker played Pennies from Heaven. Uh, when MacArthur finally did land uh, in Leyte, why the loudspeaker, because the Japs would never get this, would say, well, better Leyte than never. And so voices were being passed around. There was, so it was the Japanese newspapers and when something big happened everybody heard about it because of the secret radios. Um, this is for after liberation. Um, was it hard when you were back with children who were teenagers of your own age and you got home and they had had just a fairly regular life for the past three years when you had been through this? Was it awkward? Did, they, did you feel so different, or did you just no. forget? No, it wasn't. Uh, first of all, you come back to your own country, and uh, you're a bunch of kids who haven't uh, uh, experienced what you've been through. Um, I think what we all do, I certainly I know what I did, I, you adapt, you vanish into America, and uh, uh, you just don't talk about it. And then you're just one of you just, where are you from? Well, I'm from Cohoes and uh, it, you just go in with the world that's around you and uh, for years I would never talk about being in a prison camp and that's not because I was bearing it I didn't want to be showing off or being different by the same token when I went to university I worked for a year then went to college and the place was full of GIs uh, with the GIs you were you you were an ex-prisoner and you knew, they had something with you that was in common. Uh, you could exchange stories. And you didn't change a lot. It just, you'd been there, they'd been there. Uh, and you didn't exchange a lot of stories. The guys who tell stories are at this point are the old men who like to remember it. And at that point, the guys who've done it talk least. And that's still true. But you knew. You knew who was who. Do you think there were lasting For some people there were. I think for someone as young as myself and uh, lucky genetics, uh, uh, if there were, I don't, well, wait a minute. I'm probably an inch shorter than I would have been, at least, come to think of it. Uh, and uh, always been a little pissed off about that. Uh, but uh, no, other than that, scholarship you know, for you. <laughs> but, uh, but physically though, uh, uh, I was, uh, always been, you know, I'm, I'm lean, 
And as one big guy from New York when I was serving in Korea ex exclaimed, I said, when we were doing something, he says, McCrary, you're not small, you're just wound tight. Uh, <laughs> so I think not. I think for the young people, uh, I, I don't know of anybody of the young people who had these problems. My mother, by the same token, uh, 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 never quite recovered. Uh, and part of that is because a mother, now uh, being a mother, well, this food will try to give her child some of hers, pretending she's not hungry. What was your family? I had myself uh, and two sisters. Uh, we were all in different places initially. I was in, uh, I was in the southern island, Panay. Iloilo was the capital. My mother was vis visiting my dad and I was with her. And an older sister, my older sister, was up in the Buki, the mountains. Because if the Japs came in, we'd heard of the rape of Nanking. Uh, we wanted to be away. Well, the Japs landed while mother was there, and she could not get away, and dad was an older man. So they stayed in town, and another man and I uh, sneaked through the Japanese lines and went up to the country. And then after four months, we were captured. Then we were all held. My parents, by the way, thought I was dead. Uh, we were all held in a small camp, 50% English and 50% Americans, the way it worked out there. Then uh, uh, we were pulled up to Santa Tomas. And uh, while uh, by this time there was my father, my mother, my sister, myself, and my second sister, uh, uh, Betsy had been up at a boarding school and she came down six months later. So from 16, uh, she was 16 when it opened. She had been totally alone in a small prison camp. Uh, for about a year and a half. Uh, and we were released in a goddamn wonderful show. Uh, the tank broke down the gate and the, our boys uh, swooped in. And it's really hard to talk about it without choking up. Uh, but um, the joke part of it is that I have, my older brother had been in college in the States and was with Patton's almost secret forces. They were the uh, uh, scout cars that were always in front of the Third Army. And uh, he'd been across the river for three days behind enemy lines and was captured about three or four weeks after I was released. And that proves that there is a God and he is just and he has a sense of humor because by God John got a taste of it too. But his was just for two months. Is that enough? One last question. Um, does it surprise you? Does it anger you? Does it disappoint you that so few people know this story? No, there's no reason anybody should particularly know about it. What does irk one a lot is uh, in the professional American guilt and uh, this uh, beating of the breast about the uh, Japanese uh, internees in this country uh, who were treated not harshly, but very firmly, and perhaps foolishly, but it seemed like a good idea at the time, and the president was the one who had done it. Uh, and as these stories build, and this really strange American uh, self-loathing among some of us, if America does it, it's wrong. Uh, I'll tell you something. Those, with my sympathy, those Japanese internees had it made. What happened to us? and to especially the civilians in Indonesia under really bad Japanese treatment. Uh, maybe people should know about that. And uh, uh, by and large, uh, I think the Americans uh, generally treat people pretty straight. Uh, and uh, there's that point there. The other one maybe interesting thing to uh, yourselves is uh, I, of course, volunteered for Korea. Uh, I was an engineer lieutenant. I uh, got flown over and landed in Japan to join a division. Uh, and this was very early in the war when it was, uh, when we got our tail kicked a lot. Uh, but at the station, uh, I saw this man in a Japanese army uniform. It was sort of in rags. He's probably a you know, homeless. But for about 10 seconds, I, my fingernails were so tight. And then I said, oh, for Christ's sake, it's over. The poor bugger, uh, he's a lost soul. And I never had anything like that again. But the first sight of a Japanese uniform, I was just in a rage.